U.S. lawmakers seek to curb Chinese purchases of American farmland. Showcasing their innovations and potential of Nigeria's tech sector, geeks, startups, and budding entrepreneurs celebrate innovation, collaboration, and growth at the Lagos Startup Expo. Hello, and thanks for tuning into the show that goes around the continent to bring you stories near and far. I'm Joker Rogers at Channels Television here in Lagos. And I'm joined by Vincent McCory from Voice of America in Washington. Well, thanks. I'm Vincent McCory at The Voice of America. Happy to be with you again for another edition of Africa 54. Let's start off with the latest from Nigeria. Joker Rogers in Lagos brings you that story. The Lagos Startup Expo was an opportunity for tech enthusiasts and startups to showcase their innovations as well as the potential of Nigeria's tech sector by highlighting the three key concepts, which are innovation, collaboration, and growth. The expo provided a platform for startups and budding entrepreneurs to network and learn in a bid to drive the growth in the ecosystem. Here's the report. A convergence of startups, innovators, tech enthusiasts, and investors to foster innovation, as well as the growth of Nigeria's tech industry. Okay. Tech events serve as a melting pot of different ideas and a platform for collaboration, which is why TechPoint Africa brings them all together to showcase their solutions and connect. Through critical conversations and insightful workshop sessions, participants are exposed to a wealth of ideas as they learn about the latest industry trends. Nigerians require an alternative solution for cross-border transactions. Seemingly easy purchases such as paying for apps on App Store or your subscription become so difficult. The Expo also served as a means to help burden startups and entrepreneurs take their businesses to the next level and the chief servant at TechPoint Africa says they fulfilled that objective. By bringing tech enthusiasts, potential customers together in one place and gathering all the startups and businesses to in one place, we provide the opportunity to you know, grow the market, engage with your audience, generate leads, also collaborate, because startups can also collaborate with each other. Another, issue, another challenge they have is always um, you know, being able to grow, and sometimes they need partnerships to be able to do this. It was a day of innovation, collaboration and growth, especially for those passionate about the rise of the ecosystem. In the last year or year and a half, there has been a slowdown in global funding. Um, and when I say global funding, I mean private equity and venture capital. But what's happened is that there's now a flight to fundamentals. Basically, only the strong survive. So companies who would deliver consistently on the fundamentals, strong unit economics, show strong growth, and show that they can be resilient in the face of cyclicalities. Those companies are the companies that will survive in the coming few years because there's a liquidity crunch around the world, not just for in Nigeria, in Africa, and with global investors. So that's what it looks like. And the companies who are gonna raise funding going forward have to be more resilient than the ones we've seen before. The Lagos Startup Expo is a demonstration of the impressive progress of the tech sector and how those passionate about its success stay committed to nurturing entrepreneurs, fostering innovation and inspiring creativity. Let's get more on this. Chief Servant, Tech Point Africa, Muiwa Matuluko, joins us on Africa 54. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So what are your thoughts on Nigeria's startup ecosystem? How would you rank us globally? Globally, ah, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, we're number one in Africa, without a doubt. Uh, but if we go to start ranking globally, then um, <laughs> there are a lot of factors in play. But we're definitely one of the top. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening. There's a lot of um, growth. There's a lot of uh, a lot of activity and of course we attract a lot of funding in africa nigerian startups are one of the top three you know every year that attracts um venture capital that's one of the I mean, key signals you can use even though it's not necessarily um, the best signal but that's one of the easiest signals you can use to show that how much how much value is being generated in the, in the nigerian startup space so our rank was very high globally but number one in africa oh, wow. 
And how can we take advantage of tech talents and deepen innovation in the ecosystem? Um, I mean, there are many parts to it. The private sector has roles to play, the public sector has roles to play. Majorly, the public sector has to create an enabling environment. Um, and I mean, depending on who you ask, that's either uh, the environment is either enabling enough or it's not enough. Um, I think there needs to be a balance. So we, we've seen um, policies like the Nigerian Startup Act. We've seen uh, policies like the Nigerian Broadband Policy and the Broadband Implementation Policy. Um, these are very good policies on paper, but they are much more difficult to implement. But at least we see government trying to you know, make an um, inroads there. But in the private sector, I mean, we have um, a lot of entrepreneurs who have been empowered over the years, you know, investing in, in, in new entrepreneurs. Um, we have um, a lot of talent also, you know, being, um, cutting their teeth, you know, at many of these Nigerian startups. Yes, there's the challenge with, you know, um, what you call the Jaffa syndrome, you know, flights, when they get to a certain uh, level of uh, skill level, they then look for better opportunities outside the country. But then they, that still ties back, you know, to the issue of the enabling environment. Right? So if all of this, um, both the public and the private sector can play their roles, we can definitely continue to encourage a lot of innovation and collaboration. And um, I, I would say we're, we're, I mean, we're doing fairly well, but there's so much more room for improvement and it can only get better. It can only get better. What are the specifics of things that need to be done to provide this environment, to keep us, to keep us you know, at that level that we first described when we started? Yeah, one of the major, um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, you know, a lot of startups or the, the very common rhetoric we hear is, you know, funding, funding, uh, capital issues, um, issues with capital and funding. Um, maybe to an extent, yes, the, those are issues. But the truth is when there is a market, a thriving market, a, a market with high potency power, a market that is well educated, you know, internet or savvy, tech savvy, literate um, markets with purchasing power. There's just always, there's always um, enough of transactions and activity going on, you know, to support a lot of um, the digital economy. So one of the major, one of the major challenges, like I could go straight to the point, is internet accessibility or internet connectivity. Depending on who you ask, um, there are over a hundred million internet users in Nigeria. But if you go down to the specifics, you find that a lot of these are, you know, double figures because a lot of people have uh, uh, two or three um, SIM cards. They have one for backup for internet and, and stuff like that. And so, if you look, if you if you look at the proper size of the market, the, the digital economy, the online market, we're probably about twenty or thirty million at best. And then when you break it down further in terms of purchasing power, maybe the market is only bigger than 2 million or 3 million people who can you know, afford to. So the first thing is, first of all, getting more people on the internet. Uh, how much of these issues, you know, is Tech Point Africa looking to take care of, especially with programs like the Lagos Startup Expo? Yeah, th thanks for that question. So, I mean, we, we, we can only do our little best and we hope that more people will do you know, do that um, and we'll just continue to try to inspire. And that's why we actually um, created the Lagos Startup Expo because one of the issues, again, like I said, is um, the mar markets. I don't believe that um, finding funding capital is necessarily a primary problem for startups. They just need the market. And sometimes they don't even know how to get these people um, or they can't reach them, you know. They, we, for example, we don't have very, very um, homogeneous, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there's, there's no one, there, there are not that many online communities, online, online, communities online that can meet a homogeneous audience, you know, set of Nigerians that you want to you know, target. It's really broad, broad channels, you know, Facebook and, and the likes. And so the, bringing together the potential consumers in one place, bringing together all the innovators, the builders in one place, and fostering that, you know, that learning, that collaboration. That was what we tried to do with the Lagos Startup Expo. We had over 90 business, 90 startups exhibited there. Over 3,500 people um, attended. So you can imagine how much collaboration was happening between the businesses because sometimes they need partnerships to actually try. So rather than trying to look for um, capital 
that you, you may end up spending uh, uh, what you call like spending without uh, uh, much control or without much discipline. Why not find key partnerships with other uh, you know, startups or businesses that kind of align with what you're trying to do or can solve the problem you have, you know, partner with them and then you know, so collab creating that environment for them to collaborate. So you can imagine how much of that happened. You can imagine how much of how much um, there was how much of a lead generation happened, you know, getting uh, potential customers. So that was what we we're trying to do. And we hope that uh, this can spread across all the different regions in Nigeria. And we also hope that, you know, gets support of uh, every, everyone else in the ecosystem uh, you know, to get this done. A chief servant, Tech Point Africa, Muiwa Matuluko, thank you for expanding our knowledge further on this subject. Thank you for your time on Africa 54. Thanks for having me. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on viewingafrica.com. After the break, while the world's largest chocolate makers reap profits, Guinea and cocoa farmers struggle to raise incomes. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent Macquarie in Washington. The world's biggest chocolate producers are enjoying record profits, but are failing to pass on the benefits to cocoa farmers, many of whom are suffering falling incomes and worsening poverty, according to a report from the charity Oxfam. Henry Ridgewell reports. Ghana is the world's second largest producer of cocoa. Farmers' incomes in the country fell 16% on average since the start of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020, according to Oxfam's analysis. COVID, of course, was a big disruption, but then also the, the war in Ukraine and the resulting uh, economic crisis, um, coupled with some more longer-term challenges like the impact of climate change and um, aging farms, which is a big um, issue in Ghana. Oxfam says many Ghanaian cocoa farmers survive on just $2 a day. At the same time, Oxfam says profits for the world's biggest chocolate firms, Hershey, Lint and Sprungli, Mondelez and Nestle, have increased by 16% since the pandemic. And that translates into 15 billion of profit by just the four largest uh, public chocolate companies since 2020. Ivory Coast is the world's biggest producer of cocoa. Here too, farmers complain of falling incomes. We planters are poor. The Westerners who come to buy cocoa are getting rich. Meanwhile, we are suffering. We earn nothing. We suffer cultivating the fields. That's why we ask the government to help us. The governments of Ghana and Ivory Coast signed a deal in 2021 to try to get a bigger share of the chocolate industry's profits by setting a minimum price and obtaining a cash premium per tonne of cocoa, which is an extra sum paid directly to farmers on top of the commercial price of cocoa. But Oxfam says the payments have failed to meaningfully increase farmers' incomes. If you as a company are profitable at the same time as the, the, the producers of your most critical raw material are falling deeper into poverty, then there's something wrong with your business model. Lint and Sprungli told VOA they pay Ghanaian farmers a $60 per tonne premium and invested over $20 million in cocoa sustainability programs in 2021. Hershey said it aims to support better livelihoods for farmers with cash transfers and loans. Mondelez and Nestle did not respond to VOA requests for comment. Let's move ahead. Chinese ambassador to South Africa, Cheng Jiadong, says children are the future and as such should be nurtured and protected as part of celebrating International Children's Day. The Chinese embassy in South Africa donated food parcels to the Bramley Children's Home, a residential care facility for traumatized, abused and neglected children. The International Children's Day dates back to the World Conference for the Wellbeing of Children, which was in Geneva in 1925. Channel TV South Africa correspondent Innocent Simosa reports. South Africa joined the global community to celebrate the International Children's Day. 
China's ambassador to South Africa, His Excellency Chen Shiwaundong, joined forces with Minister Nkosazana Lamini Zuma to hand over a generous donation of food parcels to the Bremley Children's Home. We had the opportunity to speak with Ambassador Chen Shiwaundong, who shared his thoughts on this joint initiative. Today's event, we want to work through our working with the department, uh, with the uh, Bremney home, to show our care and support for those children, lovely children, uh, to provide through our providing the, the food supply and donation to them. as is the part of our uh, efforts for support those children and the youth in need. UNICEF used to say the children must have the first call on our resources. Because if you do not look after the children, then you are not worth of the future. Child hunger in South Africa is a significant and ongoing issue that affects many children in the country. Despite South Africa being classified as an upper middle income country by the UN Population Fund, there are still widespread disparities in income and access to resources, resulting in high levels of poverty and food insecurity. We, we care for 46 children, so they are in various different schools. They come from very bad circumstances. So our needs vary from food and everyday transport to 14 different schools, as well as therapy, clothing, toiletries. And then we want to provide the children with the best education and opportunities they can get. Many families in South Africa struggle to afford basic necessities, including food. According to the South African Child Gauge 2022, approximately 59% of children in the country were living below the upper bond poverty line in 2019. Government says efforts are being made to address child hunger in South Africa it's now time for a short break. As we do, remind you to visit our website, channelstv.com, for news and programming around the clock. You can also find us at youtube.com forward slash channels web. And still to come, doing well to doing good. Hughes Guba is a Burkina Bay rapper who uses the proceeds from his ticket sales to build schools in his crisis-worn country. Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Some U.S. lawmakers are urging legislation to curb sales of U.S. agricultural land to foreign entities, specifically China. Of more than 100 countries with U.S. land investments, China ranks 18th in holdings. As viewers Ken Farabell reports, while concerns about China gobbling up U.S. farmland resound in Congress, experts say it is more a political issue than a practical one. One of the United States' top producers of corn and soybeans is the state of Illinois, where Wendell Shawman farms land his family has owned for generations near the city of Galesburg. He says he's worried about Chinese investors purchasing farmland like his. From 2019 to 2020, companies with shareholders connected to China increase their overall U.S. land holdings by nearly 30 percent. It's uncomfortable having your, your major competitor, an outfit that's shaking their sabers at you all the time to be owning land here. That makes you a little nervous. But Shaman admits he doesn't know any farms nearby connected to China. I don't know of any in this area. In Jacksonville, Illinois, Luke World's company manages land transactions throughout the region. In 15 years, I've never even had communication uh, with an investment group that I've known to be uh, Chinese. He says most of the transactions he's involved with stay local. In my 15-year career, I've never sold a farm to, to any international buyer. Iowa Republican Senator Joni Ernst is among lawmakers calling Chinese ownership of American farms a threat. If you add up all of the acres of Chinese-owned farmland, it is nearly the size of my home state of Iowa. According to the U.S. Agriculture Department, Chinese-connected investors own less than 162,000 hectares of land in the U.S., only a fraction of which is farmland. So China owns almost no farmland in the United States. 
Bruce Sherrick is a professor of agricultural and consumer economics at the University of Illinois. Of millions of hectares of U.S. agricultural lands owned by foreign entities, Sherrick says Chinese ownership barely registers. Less than 1%. Recent efforts by Chinese-connected investors to buy land near military installations in Texas and North Dakota have fueled concerns about national security risks. But Sherrick says foreign-owned properties are typically managed or tended to by local entities, often American farmers. I don't think it's super important to know who owns what because the land that's producing things doesn't know who owns it. So I think as a matter of agricultural policy, it's probably not a very big deal. Sherrick adds farmland remains an attractive investment for any potential buyer. Very high uh, average returns through time and very low systemic risks. In Streeter, Illinois, farmer David Iserman also doesn't know of any land near him owned by foreign investors. It's kind of a non-issue. While he'd prefer local ownership over Chinese investment, Iserman doesn't see a need for legislation limiting foreign land ownership. Wendell Shawman disagrees. In rural America, I think there'll be a lot of support for this. Yeah, I just assume not have China coming in and throwing money around and, and who knows what doing whatever else. Beyond any action Congress might take, a number of state legislatures are also considering restricting foreign land ownership. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Kirkwood, Illinois. Whenever you see Hughes Guba clad in his native Burkina Faso wear, he must be out for one of his special concerts. The rapper uses his gifts to entertain the crowd, but uses the proceeds for development in the crisis-torn country. The crowds love the music, which Guba is using to fund what he sees as a very important aspect of community life, education. Under the multicolored strobe lights of Wagadugu's largest sport arena, a crane lowers Bukinabe rapper Hughes Guba towards a sea of clamoring college students eager to hear some of their favorite songs in exchange for the cost of a ticket. The money will be destined for greater places than Guba's pockets. However, banners throughout the arena read, One Concert, One School, signaling to the audience that a portion of every purchase will go to building a school in a village without one. That's why we came out, to support this young man and to show that in Africa too, there are young people who think about these kinds of projects. Burkina Faso's struggle to contain an Islamist insurgency has faltered in recent months, creating one of the world's fastest growing populations of internally displaced people. The fighting has also left education access in Burkina Faso critically impaired, with over a million children affected by school closures and 6,134 academic institutions shut as of February. Guba, who goes by the stage name Hugo Boss, hopes that by holding concerts with a specific aim of fundraising for schools in such areas, he can prove that locals are capable of closing that gap without leaning on international aid. His first school, fully funded through concert sales, is nearing completion and he aims to complete more by the end of the year. As access to clean drinking water becomes increasingly difficult in many parts of the world, one company is using an innovative technology to help address this problem for underserved communities in the United States. VOA's Julie Tabo has more. Safe drinking water is a vital resource that is out of reach for one of three people worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. That includes more than two million Americans living without running water, something the nonprofit firm Dig Deep is working to help solve. Native American families are 19 times more likely than white families to not have running water, and black and Latino households are twice as likely. The Navajo Nation is the country's largest Native American reservation, stretching across the western states of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. 40% of the population here has no running water, meaning people must often travel up to 100 kilometers into town and back to get it. To help address this water shortfall, the company Source Global has installed hydro panels to collect vapor from the air and create clean drinking water for 500 homes. When you see a source hydro panel, it looks a little bit like a, a normal solar module, except for just a little thicker. And what it's doing is taking in sunlight and air to make 
perfect drinking water. If you and I were to take one out of a box and set it up on the ground in 15 minutes, half an hour later, we get a glass of water. Every hydro panel is effectively an independent water supply. That's a life-changing development on the Navajo Nation, especially for older community members. Some of them said that, you know, I never thought in my lifetime that I would have drinking water pumped into my house. It's a blessing uh, for, for me to see this. With climate change and aging infrastructure contributing to population pressures on water supplies, Wechter says what's needed is comprehensive, proactive outreach to every community without safe drinking water. Julie Tabo, VOA News. Well, and that's our show for today. You can find all the continent's top news and world news online at voaafrica.com. Check it out. I'm Vincent McCory in Washington. Channel's television has our last word. We look forward to bringing you another show next week. To remember that channelstv.com remains your source for news and other programming. Round the clock. I'm Jocka Rogers. Thanks for watching and goodbye.